Cray. Look, Fred Cray ran the breaking squad for a long time, the, the break and enter squad for a long time. And in that capacity, he arranged a lot of robberies, which criminals used to do, and now and again they had to get some people arrested. And so uh, he arrested a few people now and again, but down to scale people. He dealt with the likes of Lenny McPherson uh, to organise the crimes. And uh, he was uh, the distributor of the wealth. And they shared, they shared the money in the, uh, in the breaking squad. Uh, a suitcase full of money came in every Friday. I mean, this is extraordinary in police headquarters. And they divided it up. The breakers' rivers of graft flowed all the way to the top, reaching Premier Bob Askin and his police commissioners. Mackay's assassins, Fred Cray and Keith Kelly, were both former breaking squad detectives. In 1978, Detective Sergeant Joe Parrington, the man in charge of the Mackay murder, was transferred to the breaking squad where he was surrounded by Cray's ex-lieutenants. John Whelan was named as one of the Black Knights of corrupt New South Wales detectives by John Hatton. Whelan became the head of the police investigation for the Woodward Royal Commission, which was set up one month after Mackay's murder to investigate the drug trade in New South Wales. It was Whelan who warned Bob Trimboli when he was about to be arrested for involvement in the murder, enabling him to escape overseas. Hatton said it was a scandal that Whelan was so closely involved in the investigation of the Mackay murder. Thirty years after the murder, Justice Woodward explained the failure of his royal commission. I'm afraid that um, it's like many uh, commissions uh, that uh, are established by the government. It's never intended that they should find out too much. Cray was able to get away with the murder, not just because he was protected by the police, but also because he was protected by the Australian media. I had the Sydney Journalist Club and the senior police rounds person for the, I think the then Sun newspaper, the evening newspaper, Jimmy Madden, uh, was there. I, I should briefly explain that I didn't get on terribly well with police rounds people. They tended to wear blue shirts and identify themselves as policemen and were fed the information that we all read as the crime stories uh, from predominantly crooked police and never questioned what was going on. Never questioned. Anyway, Madden was um, talking to me and we talked about Fred Cray, the former corrupt killer cop, being appointed to the staff of Fairfax as a, a criminal and crime and police consultant, uh, an advisor to the journos, tell them uh, tell them where the crimes were. And uh, Madden, Madden said, no, it's, it's fine, it's fine that he's there. He knows where all the skeletons are buried, you know. And I, I thought that was probably most appropriate because he probably put some of them there himself, you know. I think for people who don't understand the depth of corruption that existed in New South Wales, I would need to explain that where the skeletons are buried are that you have a very corrupt former policeman actually dictating to the best news organisation in Australia, as it was then at the time, uh, which stories to run and which not to run, which, which skeletons to discover and which to lay, that lay dormant. And I would presume Juanita's and Don Mackay's skeletons, for example, were those that are to be left alone. Version or the, oh, the soundbite version. <laughs> version is that Juanita, um, it was generally thought that Juanita, who was the heiress of a wealthy retailer uh, family in Sydney, uh, but had broken out. Uh, she'd, um, uh, 
moved to King's Cross, had uh, started her own little suburban newspaper, uh, and was campaigning, among other things, campaigning against some pretty severe redevelopment in the gorgeous old tree-lined Victoria Street, King's Cross. Um, and she disappeared on the uh, 4th of July, 1975. Uh, vanished, um, never to be seen again. She was first reported as missing, but within three days, like by the time the weekend was over, uh, it was a Friday, she vanished. Um, the case was taken over by the New South Wales Special Crime Squad, which uh, uh, we thought was very unusual at the time because she was just a missing person at that time. There was no, no suggestion of foul play. And if there was, who knew what? So a colleague of mine and I, Barry Ward, we actually spent three years investigating not only what happened to Juanita, but also the very clear uh, um, matters that came to us was a very extensive police cover-up of what had happened. So their inquiry was a sham. And in fact, I have uh, documents in a safe place uh, about yay thick of documents compiled by a policeman, all devoted to totally, absolutely discrediting everything that Barry Ward and I ever said about the Juanita Nelson thing over three years. And I say now what I used to say then, after three years, we may not have been 100% correct, but there's no way in the world we would have been 100% incorrect in the assumptions we've drawn. Um, accused, you public think accused Crow of the murder, or is it just Crow of the murder? Of the Nielsen murder? Yes. I was given information by a Commonwealth policeman who had interviewed Lenny McPherson, Mr. Big of Sydney Crime. McPherson was, uh, um, uh, they call him a fizz gig. He's a, a police informer of an extraordinary nature. He would put in criminals all over the place. He, he cut a monthly reel-to-reel -reel tape to give to the senior New South Wales police reporting on all criminal activities across New South Wales. He was a dobber in it, a rat. And uh, thus, uh, he maintained his long um, uh, uh, protection, immunity against any prosecution. McPherson, he was offered the contract on killing Juanita Nielsen. He, he didn't take it. He considered it was far too political. But the person who did take it was the same man who killed the late superintendent, Don Mackay at the CIB headquarters. Don, Don, Ferguson. Don Ferguson, I'm sorry. Don Ferguson at the CIB headquarters. Now, without getting into whether or not Ferguson was murdered or committed suicide, as is the popular belief, it was common mileage among cops and journos around Sydney at the time that Freddie Cray had killed Mackay. Whether it was true or not isn't the point. The point is that McPherson was pinpointing Cray as the person who had been offered, uh, I'm sorry, who took up the contract on killing Juanita. Uh, 